Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, take your seats, and we will, we will begin. Thank you all very, very much for being here this morning for what I know is going to be an uh, extremely interesting uh, presentation. I'm Princeton Lyman. I direct the Africa Studies Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Very pleased to be here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center. Howard Wolpe, who you all know, uh, who directs the African conflict programs here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, is away on travel, sends his warm regards to our speaker and, and to all of you. 
Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, and it couldn't happen at a more appropriate time given the concerns and the interests that are going on in the region of Africa. Uh, Mr. Stephen Colonzo Musioka is a member of parliament uh, in Kenya. Uh, he has occupied almost every ministry in the, in the Kenyan government. I've been, I've been absolutely astounded by it. He's been twice Minister of Foreign Affairs. He has been Minister of Education, Minister of Tourism and Information, Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. Did I get them all? I think I got them all. <laughs> Uh, he's a lawyer by training, which is probably why he can do all those different things. But uh, uh, we're very delighted because um, he has been a major player in the negotiations on major regional conflicts, Sudan and Somalia, and the related issues in the, in the region. And as you all know here, Kenya has been at the center of trying to bring about peaceful resolutions of these conflicts, particularly in the Horn of Africa, uh, and has been a, a main player in bringing the parties together, bringing the international organizations together, working through the very long and difficult processes of peace. We, uh, we are seized here with the issues of Sudan for a very long time, not only the North-South conflict, but the Darfur conflict, which continues. Uh, to be a major, major concern, and related to that, the conflict in northern Uganda that spills over back and forth into Sudan. And most recently, a great deal of attention has been paid to the uh, developments in Somalia, the uh, ascendancy in Mogadishu of the Islamic Courts Alliance, and what that means for the, the future of Somalia and the efforts uh, the, to bring about uh, normalcy uh, to that country. So, uh, Mr. Michoko, there's much, much to learn today, and we are absolutely delighted, and uh, we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lehman, and all of you good friends. Um, I've been asked to talk very briefly about um, the Kenyan view on regional conflicts. And I think that's quite a wide subject. And therefore, I'll be forgiven for sometimes even probably digressing out of what one would like to call a region. Um, it has often been said that um, Kenya is seemingly an island of peace in an otherwise troubled region. Um, and indeed, it's so. Um, although I, I might uh, this morning as expected, <clears throat> concentrate a little bit more on the conflict uh, situations in the Horn of Africa and uh, more specifically Somalia, and, and also some, say something about uh, Southern Sudan, and maybe just hear from you or say one or two things about uh, Darfur in, in Sudan. Uh, I think it's important to begin uh, by acknowledging uh, that um, um, the African, mainly the East African region, um, has over the last decade or so uh, been witness to uh, very difficult uh, humanitarian situations. Um, as it occurred to any of you that um, Rwanda, for instance, is an East African country. As I speak to you, uh, the East African countries, the core countries of Kenya, Uganda, and, uh, and Tanzania have taken a decision to admit both Rwanda and Burundi as new members to the East African community in November this year. Latest I gather by November this year. So you're talking about um, a sizable East African population. And, and even those in Eastern DRC consider themselves as part of East Africa, the Kisangani area. And I'm sure that uh, those of you who have been following developments in that region will know that sometimes East Africans go and fight in the Congo. A good example is when Uganda and Rwanda actually went out there and fought in the eastern DRC. Um, 
twice, not even once. And and all because, as they say, there's nothing permanent. What what is permanent is is national interest. Um, but we're also beginning now to we've learned the ropes, and we think it is about time we we thought of um, a greater regional integration. I was privileged to have been the chair of the first ministerial uh, tripartite uh, uh, meeting that uh, I had was charged with the responsibility of jump starting. Uh, the East African integration for a second time. I'm also told that uh, the European Union actually was fashioned along the East African community as it then was, which then broke down in 1977 due to political bad faith. That time, uh, Idi Amin was in charge of Uganda. Malimo Julius Nyerere could not stomach Idi Amin in Dar es Salaam. And uh, we had uh, President Kenyatta, and we had this uh, mismatch between Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, which uh, was partly a result of um, the Cold War situation. And uh, friends in Tanzania practicing uh, socialism, African socialism, Ujama and Nyerere, and the great statesman and African statesman in Nyerere accepted that he made a mistake of uh, Ujama, which was the other word of really living in villages. And that time I remember there was such uh, political, such a big difference uh, politically between Kenya and Tanzania that Kenyans will, or Tanzanians will refer to Kenyans as man eat man society. And, uh, and then the Kenyans will quickly hit back and say Tanzanians were man-eat-nothing society. <laughs> <laughs> and Uganda then, everybody, Uganda, Idi Amin claimed the territorial sovereignty of a Kenyan soil up to and including our town of Naivasha, and it was not possible. Then East African community broke down. It was a terrible mistake. And when, um, as uh, occasion would have it as the foreign minister between 1993 and 98. There was such tension between uh, former President Moy and President Museveni that I even used extra diplomatic channels to get the, the two uh, sitting together. And when they were able to talk even on telephone, we were, yet, we were able yet again to move to Arusha. And it was in that capacity that I was asked to be the first chair of ministers who were supposed to uh, work for reintegration yet again. And we did our best. Today, then, we have a vibrant East African community. Even a year or so ago, we signed the East African Customs Union. And it was exciting even to oversee discussions leading to, to that arrangement. I remember that before Mali Munyerere left us, um, we were discussing the conflict in Burundi. He was actually the first chair, and uh, Nelson Mandela, President Mandela, uh, took over from the initiative of Tomalimo, left us uh, over Burundi, and, and it did so with such a sense of determination that we all knew that uh, things were going to change in Burundi. But under the stewardship of Mwalimu Nyerere, we even took some drastic uh, steps like um, um, recommending economic sanctions against Burundi, because we realized that uh, the warring factions were not able to come to the negotiating table, and, and some of them were um, serious um, opportunists, and, and, and the whole thing was the web was, uh, was so deep that um, the countries in the region, particularly the DRC uh, then, was, was uh, so much involved, I realized that ladies also have a serious matter of, uh, uh, when it comes to this. A lady was funding one of the warlords called Nya, 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 um, Nyamonga, I think that was the name, and, and bankrolling that particular warlord, it was difficult. But under Nyerere, we realized subsequently that uh, we're not making progress, we lifted the economic sanctions, and, and then the process, the, the negotiations in, uh, in Arusha were jump-started yet again. And today, we are proud to say that that conflict in Burundi is manageable, they're able to see some, some light now at the end of this, uh, what has otherwise been a long tunnel 
as privileged to have been able to, to look into that uh, issue of Nyangoma and other people, um, NCCD and, and, and very serious matters. And remember when um, the plane that was carrying for the late President uh, Habiri Amana was shot down over Kigali, it was also it was in the company of a Burundi president and things went haywire in that whole region. And of course, the genocide of 1994. When the world um, apparently just closes its eyes uh, to the suffering of, 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 of the people of that African country. But today, under the stewardship of President Kagame, Rwanda has made tremendous progress. It's like a lifting of um, the famous phoenix from, from the ashes. And, and now we are able to see progress. Uh, but of course, we cannot forget the pain. I was able to attend the 10th uh, anniversary of the genocide in Kigali and was able to witness the French delegation walking out because President Kagame could not uh, hold his, his emotions over of what he considers of the, of the, was the role that uh, France played uh, or failed not to play, did not play in, in that conflict in Rwanda. So that is, but yet, and yet, Later this year, we are able to assist Africa, receive two countries into membership that have gone through great turmoil. But I'm sure you are all not expecting me to spend time on that. You wanted me to talk about Somalia and Sudan. And uh, the subject of Somalia is most current. It's very disturbing. When again, a uh, second time, I was foreign minister, President Kibaki uh, asked me to, to look into both Sudan and Somalia. In fact, he was very clear in his mind. He wanted me to just get on with it. Um, but I also must give some credit to retired President Moy because he also did quite a bit. Before he left office, he had started um, um, the process of getting the Somalis together. And um, in our town of Eldoret, in the Rift Valley, um, those of you who know Kenya, I'm sure a lot of you do know about Kenya, but then they had been there for several months. And I realized when we took over that uh, even the integrity of the conference itself was, was compromised and uh, all kinds of complaints. Uh, and so we had to move that uh, peace and reconciliation conference to um, the town, uh, the uh, suburbs in Nairobi, a place which is now famous, um, uh, known as Bagadi. And in, within Bagadi, we were able Somalis took um, all the time, and they were not easy. But the high point in the Peace and Reconciliation Conference of Somalia was when uh, former President Abdi Qasim very unwillingly agreed to come to Nairobi and, uh, and meet with Abdullah Yusuf. Of course, out of our own intelligence network, we were able to know that the most likely warlord <laughs> Uh, to succeed Abdi Qasim was Abdullah Yusuf. And he has a, a, a big history, how he fell out with the uh, uh, dictator Siad Bare, and how eventually Siad Bare was driven across the Kenyan border, eventually died in, in, in Nigeria. And uh, Abdullah Yusuf was, spent time in Ethiopian jails. He was he's quite, a, quite a personality. Um, he wasn't even very well. And, and I think he has, um, he, ha he, he lives with a, a, a liver that has been donated by uh, an Irish boy, but in excellent health, he's been able to, to, to do well. So when uh, we were able to get them together, and if you allow me, in fact, in, in my own residence in Nairobi, and you can imagine the tension of getting two powerful warlords together, at night in your own residence, and, and they're all coming with people, and they're not that as, as strictly, as, as, as disciplined as, as we can imagine. Um, my wife thought I'd actually compromise the security of the whole family, and, and she was forgiven for that. And in fact, Abdi Qasim ended up calling my wife Shifter. Now, Shifter, <laughs> those of you know what Shifter meant, uh, was, was something else. And of course, on a lighter note, uh, they left some inscriptions in Somali language in, in our visitor's book, which I find exciting. And that actually was the moment that enabled Baghdadi to succeed. Just like in the case of Sudan, I determined that uh, unless 
President al-Bashir was able to release his Vice President Ali Osman Taha to be able to meet with the late Dr. John Garang. We were all wasting valuable time pretending that we could get the peace process in Southern Sudan going. And so I remember from my hotel room in Cairo, where I'd gone to carry President Kibaki's letter to President Mubarak, because again, those of you who know uh, the African continent well will know Egyptians of a person uh, at the Owen Falls Dam in Uganda measuring the, the depth <laughs> of, of the river, of, of the Nile waters. Because to them, Egypt is the Nile. And so anything that uh, would happen upstream with the possibility of interfering with their own livelihood would be met with resistance. Egypt can go to war over anything that has to do with the Nile. And so we had to bring President Mubarak on board. And while I was in Cairo, I felt that I needed to, um, to talk to um, Dr. John Garang. But when I got through to him, he was furious with me. He said, Kalonzo, what have you told the Arabs? He said, I don't understand you, Dr. John. He said, you know, and then what had happened was the foreign minister colleague invited me to a press briefing. And he spoke in Arabic, and believe you me, even as we speak to you, he speak to you, I don't understand Arabic. Although Kiswahili has borrowed heavily from Arabic language. And um, as you imagine, uh, Dr. Garang would have understood Arabic. And uh, it's like my friend, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, laid blame on, uh, on the SPLA of Dr. John Garang. Um, so I, um, I told him, I don't understand, but... Sometimes it's good to take advantage of a person's fury. And I did perfectly that time by saying, John, now I hear you, but in my honest assessment, unless you're willing to meet with Osman Taha, we are not making progress. And he told me I don't even mind meeting the devil himself. <laughs> and I felt a sense of breakthrough. A breakthrough. Mm. Then I decided immediately to go down to Khartoum, as to fly back straight to Nairobi, but I decided to see President al-Bashir and when I met him, and I asked him, Mr. President, please help me to help you. Would you allow your vice president to meet with Dr. John Garang? He looked at me and he thought I was somebody from Mars. <laughs> he reminded me of a story that he allowed his vice president to go all the way to Abuja at the invitation of President Obasanjo. And when uh, Ali Osman Taha flew in the presidential plane all the way, um, Dr. Garang refused to meet him. And I'm told that uh, President Obasanjo took them to his farm house, and one was upstairs, the other one was downstairs. They couldn't meet. And that created a big political storm in Khartoum. Then he said, Mr. Minister, are you serious? You want me to make this mistake yet again? I thought of an idea and I've not shared this with many people, not even the earlier group I met this morning. We had just lost our vice president, the late Michael Wamalo. And I said, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, allow me to, to suggest the following, that um, you take my word for it. I have strong feeling that uh, Dr. John will be willing this time to meet with Ali Osman Taha. But in the event that he refuses to do so, can you please send your vice president to represent you in the state funeral of our vice president? And I left it at that. I went back to my hotel room. By the evening, I received word that uh, yeah, after consultations, the president was going to allow the vice president to come, which he actually did. And I remember the day the vice president arrived at the airport he didn't go straight for the talks. He went instead to uh, the house of our late Vice President, uh, Neste Korunda, and consoled with the family. And then we started working on Dr. John Garang. It was then that um, I must admit here that um, uh, Ambassador Bellamy was able to, I think he was in touch with Secretary of State Colin Powell, and all of us agreed we must work hard to make sure that Dr. John Garang shows up. And it took us three days, which looked like eternity to General Sumbeu and myself. Eventually, 
they showed up. We went to the Great Rift Valley Lodge. And as uh, it, it turned out, although I was able myself to go and attend the funeral of our late Vice President in Kitale, the Vice President of Sudan did not show up at that funeral. <laughs> Instead, was meeting with Dr. John Garang. And that, after 20 years of, of the two gentlemen um, having been fighting each other, and they never met, and, and believe you me, again, that was a breakthrough and a high point in the negotiation process of the Sudanese, of the South, Southern Sudanese process, peace process. I wish we could do the same for Dafu. Have this sense that what has happened in Abuja was a little bit hurried, uh, but we also congratulate uh, both uh, President al-Bashir, because again he sent Ali Osman Taha to Abuja, and, um, and then the other side also came out. And the story of the Janjaweed and, and the conflict in Darfur, which has engaged world attention. But as we speak to you, the CPA, as is commonly referred to, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement for South Sudan, is seemingly holding, even in the absence of the late Dr. John Garang, who died in the plane crash, that tragic plane crash. Uh, we all felt very bad about the loss of Dr. John Garang. I remember I had to um, uh, talk strongly to his widow, Rebecca Garang, because she didn't want to be part of the government. I felt, I, f I strongly suggested to her that to me she was the person who would carry the vision of her late husband. And if she stayed out of the government of Southern Sudan, then that vision would be lost. Um, and now we are optimistic that uh, at the end of what, in terms of the CPA, is referred to as the interim period, people of Southern Sudan will be able to exercise the, their inalienable right to self-determination through a referendum, and they will also uh, be able uh, to decide whether whether or not, of course, to be part and parcel of the wider Sudan. Under the terms of Machako's protocol, it was clearly spelled out that the unity of the Sudan would be given priority. And therefore, unity has to be made attractive. And that is where we are. Now, there's seemingly now a rush towards the South Sudan. And, and um, here again, I must commend the role of uh, eager countries, Kenya, Uganda, and uh, the Horn of African uh, countries, of course, including Ethiopia, for what the role they played. And uh, that is all the ground. And very quickly, Somalia, so we can take questions. Um, we were able to work out a transitional government. As we speak to you, there isn't uh, what used to be very bad on the ground. That there was no legitimate authority in Somalia. But one of the things I remember are saying, he said, you know, the warlord should not assume that the international community will forever sit by and, and, and just cheer them along as they continued killing each other. And we've at one stage came up with a very strong statement. We're saying any person uh, trying to hold the peace process hostage would not be tolerated by the region. And that power sent a very powerful message and they all started behaving but then when eventually, after some time, President Abdullah Yusuf and his prime minister translocated not to Mogadishu but to Joha, some of the warlords who are, had since been appointed government ministers, and it was really not appointment, they minded it because it was, there had to be a process of accommodation, uh, did not feel comfortable because they thought Mogadishu being the capital should be the seat of government. And they made that such a big issue there's such a misunderstanding between the speaker and the president of that issue, Mogadishu, that that fallout, I think, has um, recently been sorted out. Um, and eventually, a lot of goodwill was lost. And now the government and parliament moved to Baidoa, a lesser city, because the um, people in charge of Mogadishu and, and were in charge of the Islamic courts. And an effort to bring peace and, and security decided to take and, and dig in. And then, of course, there was, uh, what we all know, a big fight in the last few days, uh, culminating in the 
um, if you like, overthrow of the warlords. And in the first place, these warlords are refused to take up positions. If they had taken their position that time, when, when the government was translocating to Mogadishu, I mean to Joha, if there had been goodwill right across the board, uh, I believe the situation would have been different. And there would not have been the necessity to have armed conflict between the Islamic militias and, um, and the warlords. And of course, misconception the U.S. was behind the warlords, and which I've been able to confirm uh, with uh, my good friend Jadai Frasier yesterday in the State Department, that uh, the U.S. is just being misused uh, in, in this particular way. And of course, the story of 1996, uh, Operation Restore Hope, was it, when uh, uh, I did feel he had won the Third World War against the United States and American public opinion uh, turning heavily against Somalia. I want to use this occasion to say that um, a lot of water has since gone under the bridge, and I think the leadership of the U.S. Um, should be demonstrated yet again, as in the case of Sudan, because when uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell uh, worked together with us in the region, we were able to move very fast and realize uh, peace in southern Sudan. I want to stop there because I'm sure that um, some of you may have even brighter ideas than, than, I, than, than myself, but I just wanted to give you that historical perspective. And, and, and um, the result, of course, has been over the years, Kenya has been playing host to many refugees, including a proliferation of small arms, um, therefore bringing about great insecurity for Kenya. And this is a matter that is of, of, of grave concern uh, to us in the country. Um, I'm not in government now, but I, I think the government is, is, is trying to do the right thing. When, for instance, they threw out uh, some of the warlords who were on uh, losing, came to Nairobi, and they thought they could enjoy the comfort of, of, of a capital city. And the government decided to say, no, uh, this is not on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, And you've given us a, a flavor of the dynamics of these, of these very important negotiations. If I can just ask you a question on Sudan before opening it up. Because the, the, the future of the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, is, is in part linked to the resolution of the, of the conflict in Darfur in two ways. Part of the CPA involves a broadening of the government in Khartoum itself, which is not proceeded very well. And a resolution of the Darfur crisis, in effect, implies a broadening of the entire government to bring in representation from Darfur and perhaps the East. And related to that is the resistance of the Khartoum government to uh, the UN deploying a peacekeeping force. This is negotiations going on, but kind of dragging on. What kind of role can the African Union or perhaps the East African uh, leadership play in getting the Khartoum government at least to resolve the issue of the UN peacekeepers and therefore keep the Darfur negotiating process going. Mm. Uh, thank you for that. I had occasion to discuss with President uh, Alpha Konare, the chairperson of the African Union. Um, uh, earlier, I think about the month of April, I went into Darius to Addis to check with him, um, and also trying to suggest because I've since been able to form a foundation in my name, um, and I'm the patron of the Kalonzo Musioka Foundation, and, and uh, what we intend to do is to be able to play uh, that catalytic uh, role uh, in ensuring that uh, there's no backsliding, for instance, in the um, in the case of the CPA uh, in southern Sudan, and whatever else we can do, including some of the tricks that you had me mention this morning, where we can, um, I realize the people-to-people -people contact, and sometimes things that are not ordinarily uh, within the normal uh, practice of diplomacy can achieve great results, as you had me say. Um, so I, um, I think myself, that um, Secretary General Kofi Annan um, has done tremendously well in trying to blow the whistle over Darfur. And um, it was then that I think everybody else uh, tried to come on board and um, 
we all realize that it is the primary responsibility of the United Nations Security Council to ensure international peace and security. And, and, and um, uh, once the Security Council has taken a decision, I think member countries are bound as far as is practicable. But I think one has also to look at the position of the AU that uh, a few African countries are able to, within their limited means, uh, make available uh, troops that uh, went to Darfur uh, under the auspices of the AU. And, uh, and I think Sudan was feeling comfortable. Um, and I think this is one issue also that uh, militated against uh, President Bashir's uh, taking over the chairmanship of the AU. Um, when even when he was hosting the AU summit uh, earlier this year in, in Khartoum because it was felt that he would not be uh, a neutral broker, uh, particularly if uh, the Darfur conflict is his known country. And that he said within a year, I think the decision taken was within the one year, he will, they will then be able to review the position. I think this matter comes up in the next one or two weeks in, uh, in the capital city of the Gambia where the AU will be having its next summit. Uh, it was hoped that uh, President Bashir will have changed his position. And it will be very interesting to see what he says in Banjul in the next few days over the matter of deployment of the UN security peacekeepers. Um, I think that um, although the uh, conclusions of um, the peace process in Abuja over Darfur um, looked reasonable um, and that as I have said before myself that the resolution of the Darfur conflict will to a very large extent depend on the comprehensive peace agreement for southern Sudan. Issues dealing with marginalization of, of, the, of the people of Darfur and as you mentioned that other thing the world has not noticed is a possible uh, outbreak of, of hostilities on the eastern side and the border of Eritrea and, and happily this has been so far uh, on hold. Um, and I, I think that uh, it is possible for the African Union to take a position and be able to persuade President Bashir to accept the, the presence of UN uh, peacekeeping forces. Thank you very much. Let me open it up to uh, people. Uh, when you have a question, if you would uh, both indicate your name and affiliation. Do we have microphones for people? We do indeed. So we'll start with the lady right here in the blue dress and the, wait for the microphone. If just give your name and affiliation and your question. Thanks. Harry Mullen. Um, I work with the Bosnia Support Committee, but I lived and taught in Kenya for five years. I was wondering about the <clears throat> ICC. They have indicted six people in northern Uganda, but have they indicted anyone in Darfur, and is it because of the peace process that they haven't, I don't think they have indicted anyone in Darfur, is it because of the peace process that these people will not be indicted, and do you feel that there is a way that they can actually apprehend these six people in um, uh, northern Uganda that they have indicted? Mm -hmm. I think your take could be as good as mine uh, on, on this one. Uh, so, um, as one would want to give comfort to and, and give um, negotiation a chance, and the story of Darfur has not been fully told. Um, the case of the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda has been with us for a long time, and uh, President Museveni a fuse that is really on top of uh, the situation. Um, it may be recorded that um, the late Dr. John Garang died immediately after consulting with President Museveni over the uh, Laws Resistance Army uh, situation. And in fact, Dr. J John Garang issued a very stern warning that uh, the uh, LRA uh, should seriously consider moving out of the Sudanese territory because they're operating, um, Mr. Connie's uh, forces were operating out of southern Sudan. And it's, it's, I think it's, it was possible to identify uh, some of the perpetrators of, of, this, uh, of these crimes against humanity. Um, and as I said, this Darfur situation is still unfolding. I think names have been, names have been floated. Um, 
and it's indeed a case that even the U.S. at some stage gave a list of names um, that they thought should be uh, looked into uh, as, as people who have been committing crimes against humanity. Uh, let me go over here. Uh. <clears throat> Lawrence Freeman from uh, ER Magazine. Uh, two questions, sir. One is, you made a reference to some comments with uh, John Dean Frazier about U.S. support for warlords in Somalia. I didn't quite catch you. You said that they were being misused or not understood. I would I wonder if you could clarify what you know about the U.S. support for the warlords in Somalia. Two, in the question in Sudan, uh, given some of the reports, and you probably know better than I, the, the fighting that's gone on and the tribal fighting that's gone on outside of the Janjaweed, some people say the situation is as bad or worse since the agreement. So shouldn't that cause us to look at some of the underlying assumptions that it's not simply the government of Sudan, the Janjaweed, but there's other tribal conflicts that are as intense and are going on now with the same savagery that have been reported up to this point? If you could uh, comment on those two things. Thank you. First of all, on, uh, what I said about uh, my discussion with the uh, Jedi uh, yesterday, uh, she brought to my attention the fact that uh, the U.S. is working along with Norway in trying to organize um, a seminar over, over the conflict, I mean, the, uh, the peace process in Somalia. Uh, and I thought that was very positive. Um, and though the U.S. may not take a leadership role, I'm told, mainly, this is not from her, but this is my own take, because of public opinion, the American public opinion on, on the history of the conflict in, in Somalia, of necessity, any government uh, has to be responsive uh, to uh, the way the electorate looks at these things. But I, I, my, my own, the emphasis that I, I still place is the need for the U.S. to be positively engaged, um, uh, within the framework, perhaps, of, of IGAD, and also uh, there's another framework of uh, partners, IGAD uh, Partners Forum, uh, because the European Union have been very active, and mainly Norway and Sweden. Uh, but the, she had no doubt in, in her mind that uh, the U.S. has had no role uh, with regard to alleged funding of the warlords. Um, and, and I think that's a matter of propaganda by the warlords themselves or some of uh, other interested parties. Now, on, on the continuing conflict in Darfur, the matter has gone beyond the original uh, uh, conflict, uh, heavily blamed on the Janjaweed and others. Um, I, th I think I would like to get more details on, on, on that myself, but uh, it, Sudan is Africa's largest country. I don't know whether you look at the African map and look at the, the square kilometers the country occupies. Um, I thought myself the best way is to be positively engaged and, and really within the framework of uh, what was agreed in Abuja, try to bring everybody on board. Um, but uh, uh, where, uh, as I said earlier on, I thought that um, the world could have been a little bit more patient in Abuja. Uh, one gets a sense that uh, uh, Abuja was hurried, and like um, the CPA, which, which took us so many years, actually exactly 10 years, personally I've been involved in the negotiations on the conflict in southern Sudan for about 10 years. Now, if you look at Abuja, and although it was easy for Osman Taha, who eventually was uh, asked to lead the negotiations in Abuja, but I think there was need, first of all, to build the necessary human confidence. Um, get, get some of the players who are faceless. As in the case of those of you who know the conflict in Liberia, uh, there was there an organization which was just in the habit of chopping off people's limbs and, and, and it's called RUF, R-U-F, uh, in Sierra Leone, I beg your pardon, in Sierra Leone. And, and you know, look at that, it's a faceless organization. And, and eventually, when the players are known, then the world is able to do something. Um, I think that even those perpetrating the current hostilities after Abuja, uh, post-Abuja conflict in Darfur, will, will need to be brought on board. So we have no way out, but negotiation all along. 
Um, but I think the world should continue being engaged uh, in, in Darfur, thanks to the fact that we now have freedom of the media right across the board, including my own country, Kenya. I've realized that uh, what Africa needs to do is to really, really strive for greater freedom of the press. And, and this is what will, will, will make this world safer, in my own honest opinion. Thank you. Okay. Take the lady here, and then I'm going to go to the back of the room. The lady right here, yes. Kent Law School, University of Kent, uh, UK. Um, coming back to the issue of warlords and widening it slightly, um, I wondered what your view was of this. Now, it's my belief that the issue of warlords is one that seems to be growing across many um, African con conflicts. And you just mentioned um, perhaps inviting uh, some of these warlords to uh, the negotiation tables, which I find to be a little bit controversial. Did hmm. I disagree? Yeah. yeah. Um, what I wanted to know was what your opinion is um, as to how to ameliorate the involvement of warlords in African conflict um, within the region, within the African region, and by the international community. Thank you. I remember one time we were very bored uh, in Addis Ababa, the level of foreign ministers, when you said we were not and encouraged, uh, we made strong recommendation to our heads of state to come up with a resolution saying no African country would uh, recognize any government that is uh, brought into office through a military coup d'etat. And that, I think, was a very bold step. I agree with you, the issue of warlords is controversial. But, you know, see, if you take the view that uh, no warlord uh, operates alone and they have other people whom they will have tried to convince psychologically or try to intimidate, um, you might find um, that even President Museveni himself was heavily prevailed upon by members of East African Legislative Assembly to accept he had a problem in his hands, and that's the Law's Resistance Army. He actually flatly said, no, this I would deal with. But, and then he was at variance with the Legislative Assembly in Arusha. Um, can I say this? That um, the concept of warlordship <laughs> in Africa, seemingly is growing. And I think that Africa will have to be bold and, and take a kind of decisive action that we took with regard to military dictatorship. Um, I remember also we had an organization in South Africa, a mercenary group, uh, which was called Executive Outcomes. <laughs> and it was in the habit of interfering and overthrowing legitimate governments and that, you know, soldiers on hire. And again, Africa took position. I, before coming to the United States, I met um, at um, a gathering, 11th Berlin gathering, with some friends from the DRC Congo. And one of them made a very serious joke to me. He has a, he has a farm um, in the Kivu region, uh, with, very close to the city of Goma, or town of Goma, and he told me, um, I think I'm going to become a warlord. I said, oh, you can't dare do that. He said, no. It looks to me that if you go into the bush for six months, you come out and declare yourself a general. <laughs> and then you have an army. <laughs> uh, therefore, it looked attractive to him. And he said, then I will also become another thing. I will, I will after that, uh, go and study uh, uh, divinity. I will read my Bible, go to, the, to America and become a bishop. <laughs> um, that's very interesting. It is some food for thought. Um, and yet, we cannot run away from the fact that some parts of our continent are currently engulfed in conflict, and we need to do something. Um, I'm always reminded of uh, the Shakespearean tragedy, Hamlet, where, where he said uh, that particular um, uh, key player said, Time was out of joint, oh, cursed spite, that he thought was born to set it right. I think somebody in Africa has to do something. We're moving in the right direction. The African Union in particular is getting better energized. You have heard of regional, uh, regional uh, standing armies, and Kenya is supposed to host one of them. We are, or, you know, 
countries will not be allowed to plead sovereignty when they are acting against the best interests of their own citizens. And then you say, I'm a sovereign nation, and, and out there you're carrying out genocides. So there are aspects in your governance that, uh, that seem to point in that direction. Africa will come up together and heavily against such a one or such a government. So I think we are, we are, we are moving in the right direction. Thank you. This gentleman all the way in the back who had his hand up. Yes, way back there. You got a microphone? There. Uh, my name is Osman. I'm uh, <coughs> at the uh, diplomat in residence at George Mason University. And I must, uh, to start with, uh, first of all, extend my greetings to my brother, Colonzo Masioka, whom I have known for quite a long time during the period that I was Assistant Secretary General of the OEU in Addis Ababa. It's good to see you again, friend. Uh, and I really want to uh, also uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the commendable role that you have been playing and you continue to play, particularly in the area of peace, uh, and understanding and cooperation in Africa. And I wish you all the best. Uh, having said this, I would like to pose two questions. One relates to the African Union, and the other question relates to my own country, Somalia. Uh, in, the, in regard to the first question uh, concerning the African Union, uh, I, I have taken note of the Constitutive Act which uh, establishes the union. And at the same time, I would like to point out that most of the issues that used to create or give rise to controversies have been eliminated. And you have now uh, democratization, human rights, the rule of law being reflected adequately in the Constitutive Act. But at the same time, I would like to really pose a question as to whether the, the Constitutive Act, as it exists, has been properly implemented on the ground. The other question really concerns Somalia. And in this regard, I would like to refer to the charter that has been adopted uh, in Nairobi and the peace process that have been put, uh, set in motion in order to establish a, trans a transitional government, federal government for Somalia. I'm sorry to say that for after, after a lapse of two years, so far the, there is a problem and a lot of concern that being expressed of the implementation of the charter, particularly as, uh, as uh, in regard to uh, the, the establishment of transitional institutions of government. And as you are aware, Mr. Minister, it's very difficult really to move forward without having functional institutions on the ground. Uh, could you please comment on this particular issue? And also on the issue of, uh, I know that you have referred earlier to the problem of uh, Wait, wait, can I ask you to hold it to two questions so we get to more people, if I could? Yeah, you just, yeah I just want to stop at that. But also I would like to point out, I would like to ask the minister as to, uh, in the light of the major challenges that the transitional government, federal government is facing, what views or what ideas do you have in order to, to move the peace process forward? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Osman. It's so good to see you again after many years and to look uh, see that you're doing well. Um, and thank you for the kind remarks. First of all, on the Constitutive Act of the African Union and uh, your concerns as to whether it's really getting implemented on the ground. Um, I don't know whether the audience will have heard uh, that several of the African countries, and, and mainly um, some senior African leaders, uh, President Beki, uh, President Butaflika of Algeria, President uh, Obasanjo, and indeed President Kagame and others, um, took the initiative to start the NEPAD initiative. Under this, under the terms of NEPAD, African countries are supposed to submit themselves for open examination 
and to be able to for for Africa to actually see whether they've been able to make progress on governance progress for instance in the very difficult issue of corruption in Africa and my own country is not been spared in this matter in fact Kenya submitted herself as one of the countries that for examination under NEPAD and I'm sure we've been scoring very poor scoring very badly on on the corruption bit um, and and yet this looks to me as a very positive step um, and um, therefore if if NEPAD was strengthened if, if Africa continues to take seriously the challenge of NEPAD, I think that uh, the Constitutive Act uh, of the AU will then uh, become a very, we seem to be a very useful instrument, um, positive instrument for progress in Africa. The TFG and the fact that um, under the charter that was adopted in Baghdadi, uh, it was supposed within five years. Um, uh, Somalia was supposed to see the uh, reestablishment of um, functional institutions, and I agree with you. This is why I said um, uh, earlier on that um, I think the world has been failing the people of Somalia. We need to be able to empower the, the current government, the transitional uh, federal government, um, now that at least the speaker and, and the president seem to have gotten their act together, the prime minister Gedi strikes me as somebody uh, very focused. And uh, one of the things he seems to have done is to even fire the warlords uh, following their defeat by the militias. Um, but you know, they cannot put in place those institutions where they are not funded. Um, and this has been the problem. I think the European Union has been able to make some forward moves in this area. I met with Prime Minister Gedi and he told me that he had been to Brussels and they seem to have signed some cooperation agreement with the European Union. And that's why I'm, I, I cannot uh, tire of reminding us and challenging uh, the United States, for instance, to be able to take um, a more focused and, 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 and deliberate role in trying to um, empower the transition of federal government. For at, after all, we now think the world can hold these people accountable for their actions or indeed their omissions um, when it comes even to the crucial matter of terrorism and counter-terrorism efforts um, in the world. And uh, all of us do know that Somalia is a powder keg. If I could just uh, follow up a little bit and ask for your assessment of the Islamic Courts Alliance and how the, the transitional government can, can assert itself when uh, this new alliance controls Mogadishu and has a good deal of influence. Where do you see that process going, the way, your assessment of this Islamic Court Alliance and what that means for the future of the, of the transitional government or for Somalia in general? Thank you. Islamic Court Alliance. And the word alliance has uh, been liberally used in Africa. <laughs> Even those people who want to form political parties end up with the word alliance. Yeah. And that straight away tells you there's no unanimity of approach. I think we should exploit that word alliance and isolate extremists and isolate people who actually do not mean any good for the welfare of humanity. I was saddened myself to see a young man of 14 years been given a knife and asked to execute in public somebody who had killed his own father. Now, as, as a lawyer, I had great problem with that. And I, in that is what my neighbor is, then we have a real problem in Kenya itself. Um, because of the difficult, a neighbor in distress like Somalia, to that extent, then we cannot ourselves claim to be even free. And, and be seen to be practicing the rule of law. Can you imagine what kind of a human being uh, will emerge out of that uh, a youth of 14 years? That he actually is given a knife and told, slaughter this one because he slaughtered your father. Um, I think that something needs to be done. And yet you cannot now ignore, when you're discussing Mogadishu and Somalia, the role of the Islamic Court Alliance. You need to engage them and engage them positively.
That's what I can say very briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we have lots, lots of questions. Let me, there's, uh, I see a lady's hand in the middle right there. Yes. Then I'll come back to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Mweshimiwa, for coming. Uh, Honorable Musioka, my name is Mkawasi Mcharo. Uh, I'm from Kenya. I work with the Washington Peace Center. Uh, I have uh, one question concerning uh, the resources of, of Africa. We're talking about the East African region. Now, I'm, I'm aware that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of the killing and the instability is because of the pillage of African resources by Western multinationals. And this has not been mentioned. I wonder if we are afraid of mentioning it. I wonder if we are afraid of talking about what the warlords enable, what our leaders enable, the pillage of our own resources. How are we going to address this without fearing to face Western multinationals and superpowers that are 10, 20, 30 times stronger than African countries? Uh, second, uh, we are a lot of us outside of Africa that are um, well-educated, what you call brain drain. And mon many more are continuing to come out of African countries. And my question to you, sir, is, is how is the government going to challenge to facilitate peacekeeping missions by, say, Kenyans or Somalis or any Africans that are outside? We are willing to get involved. We are willing to work with the, with the government. And we are willing to be there for our brothers and sisters who are dying needlessly. Mm. On, on a light note, Mcharo. Uh, please allow me to remind you and Ambassador Osman that I'm no longer minister in government. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I was fired um, <laughs> after defeating President Kibaki and the team in the famous uh, constitutional referendum. And the country was in two parts, the oranges and the bananas. I, I belong to the orange side, and I believe the future is orange. <laughs> um, um, and so uh, just for you to catch up with me, so when you ask me what role the government plays, I thought I could point that out politely. But even as we want to blame, and as much as we want to blame, as you say, Western multinationals of a pillage of um, African resources, I'm sure you must have read uh, Franz Fanon's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and you must have become very angry. Indeed, you sound angry. But even as you as we blame others, we should begin by blaming ourselves, if indeed we blame, we believe in the blame syndrome. Because what is going on in Africa? The scourge of corruption. African governments misusing their own people. You get to a position of authority and power, and what do you do? In Kenya, you create Anglo leasing immediately, or Golden Bag, and you get away with it. Now, if you if you do these things, in my view, you are no worse than a street robber who jumps on to ordinary citizens and, and, and does the raping and all that kinds of things. So economic rape of African resources by African leaders is an issue I believe that needs to be dealt with decisively. Indeed, these conflicts in Somalia, in the Sudan, have a lot to do with our own resources. There are conflicts that are resource-based, and I think it's a matter that is, uh, is deep down. Now, what's happening, there's, a rush, there's actually a rush, I said by saying, started by saying, there is um, some rush to, Soma, to, in, to southern Sudan. If you imagine that South Sudan itself is the size of Kenya plus Uganda, plus Rwanda and Burundi, and the only tarmac road is the airport in Juba, and even then, it looks like the streets we have in Nairobi full of potholes. Um, then you can see that um, this wonderful African country is an economic miracle waiting to happen. And as it happens, it will, it has a potential to pull with it countries of the region. I, I had myself, as they say, there's nothing permanent. <laughs> no interest is permanent. What is permanent is national interest. Even as I was working hard, to resolve the conflict in southern Sudan, I knew that um, our port city of Mombasa will be a beehive of activity when it comes to reconstruction of southern Sudan. And there will be many jobs that the Kenyan people will probably get in the business community. A lot of them are moving to southern Sudan. We are not taking full advantage. 
South Africans, in fact, are ahead of us, uh, followed by the Ugandans. And Kenyans are their neighbors um, and, and kind of sluggish, but I think they're also trying to do the best they can. So that as we, as we rebuild southern Sudan, the economy is also grow up. Um, I see a lot of interest. I wouldn't call that pillage. I think the world, after all, is becoming much closer. We are now living in a global village. Uh, although I'm as, well, as far away from Nairobi as one can possibly imagine, and I'm able to issue statements in parliament. And in fact, it may be possible now in future to vote by uh, just press a button and you vote and claim to Mr. Speaker you're also in Nairobi. It's that close. Um, so let us not be that negative, Mcharo. Um, uh, we only have a little bit less, a uh, little time, so let's make the que questions short if we can. Maybe we'll take two or three. Joel Barkin here. Uh, yes, two, two quick questions. I want to return to where you began your presentation, although it's a little less, less sexy, and that is economic integration. Yeah. Because uh, you rightly laid out the historical, uh, the political reasons for the breakup of the African fe uh, East African community, but underlying that were also structural economic reasons with Kenya's domination. Looking forward to recreating what is really the zone of peace extending all the way into eastern Congo and southern Sudan, as you just indicated, what are the obstacles to economic integration? How are you going to overcome the fear of ta the Tanzanians and the Ugandans that once again, as Kenya's economy kicks in, it will be the dominant player at the expense of the other two? And my second question deals with northern uh, Uganda. Uh, this has both international dimensions and domestic uh, dimensions, as you well know. Um, what are your views on the appointment of a special envoy? And how do you move negotiations uh, forward, uh, given uh, essentially the failure of the Bigombe efforts of a year ago? Let's take so let me get that again, the appointment of the special envoy. Special envoy to to yes, breaking the, the log jam in, in northern Uganda. Oh, I see. Okay. Let's take one or two more, and then, okay. and then we'll, uh, let's see, the gentleman there, and then the woman here. Philip Ressler, uh, African doctor scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, one of the tragic ironies of the EGOD peace process is that as it progressed, the war in Darfur escalated such that when, uh, the signing, when they were celebrating the signing of the CPA, uh, there was you know, massive death and destruction in Darfur. Some argue that the structure of the EGOD process actually contributed to the escalation of violence in Darfur and mobilization in eastern Sudan. By considering uh, the Sudan conflict a north-south conflict rather than uh, center, over-centralized and repressive center versus uh, the other regions. So my question is, in retrospect, do you think that if the EGOD process had been structured diff differently, there would have been an opportunity to nip the rebellion in Darfur in the bud or at least contribute to uh, less death and destruction in Darfur? Okay, and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the woman right here. Do we have a microphone for the woman here? Thanks. Uh, my name is Beth Tucky. I'm with the Africa Faith and Justice Network. Um, my question also has to do with northern Uganda. I'm wondering what effect you think, if any, the uh, peace, peace agreements in southern Sudan might have on the conflict in northern Uganda, given that the LRA moves so freely between the two. So. Mm -hmm. And let me just add one more question, and I'll let you finish up. We talked about Somalia and bringing all the different entities, and you talked about uh, uh, bringing the Islamic Court Alliance into the discussion. We didn't mention Somaliland, and they are a reality also. Uh, are, how do they get brought into this and their, their history and, and what they've accomplished be taken into account? So let me throw mm. all those questions to you as, as we wrap up here. Thank, Thank you. you very and uh, very quickly, yes, um, the fear of economic domination by Kenya. But in real terms, uh, how much of that uh, we're already talking about? Um, Kenya itself needs to work extra hard to be able uh, to win that extra FDI, without which we will continue to see greater suffering of the Kenyans themselves. As I speak to you, 56% of the Kenyan population live below the poverty line. 
And yet, Joe, you want me to believe that we are still the dominant economic power uh, in the region? Uh, President Kikwete has just uh, been to the U.S. Uh, and whom I met briefly in London, uh, tells me that uh, GDP growth uh, last year in Tanzania was 6.9%. Uh, we are struggling in Kenya. The minister responsible for planning has given us some figures that Kenyans themselves, right across the divide through the FM station, say, wait a minute, you must be living in Mars, not in Kenya, mm -hmm. at 4.8%. But I admit that um, the business community in Kenya, particularly the fact that we have a vibrant, we're trying to develop a vibrant middle class, um, has been able to contribute substantially to economic growth at a time when even when the political leaders are not getting the equation right. Um, but I also know that um, when we are negotiating the customs union, for instance, we, we made it sure that um, um, within the, last, the next five years, goods that um, are exported into Kenya from Uganda and from Tanzania will attract zero, will be actually zero rated for purposes of uh, customs. Um, and we call that principle of asymmetry in order to make it uh, possible uh, for cross-border investment. And therefore you have East Africa then coming up as, as one, uh, one uh, viable economic block and not one feeling that uh, there is domination by Kenya. Of course, Tanzanians are a little apprehensive about uh, uh, possible federation because we have East Africans are discussing the possibility of political federation uh, of, of East Africa. Um, because they're saying they're not quite sure uh, that they can live by the land laws that affect the Kenyan economy. Um, and so a little bit, I think, uh, hung up from Ujamaa times. And we need to be able to, to convince our brothers in Tanzania that it is doable. And of course, Tanzania has another problem a very active member of SADC. Mm -hmm. And um, while Kenya and Uganda are very strong in COMESA, um, and there's that uh, mismatch, which again needs to be addressed, because I'm told you cannot belong to two customs unions and, and that kind of thing. Um, with regard to the conflict in northern Uganda, and I'm happy that um, this issue is gaining the prominence it should. Because you, you started, uh, you heard me say that President Museveni didn't want it to be discussed. He thought he was able to deal with it, and even differed with members of the East African Legislative Assembly uh, when they called on him. I think that President Museveni uh, has now seen is, is possible. So I don't know who would appoint the special envoy. Is it the UN? Or is it the AU? Or is it that uh, President Museveni? In fact, I'm told. He was very strong as on re-election bid because he didn't want to leave office without resolving the conflict in northern Uganda. And I can understand. I can understand his, uh, his concerns over that, but that, that's, that's another issue. Um, so whatever needs to be done in order to contain that conflict, I think should actually be um, uh, brought uh, fully, fully on board. I mentioned earlier on that... Uh, the late Dr. John Garang had just had a serious dis discussion with President Museveni uh, on the fateful day when he met his death in that uh, helicopter crash. And in fact, he had issued a very strong warning to LRA that they should move out of Sudanese territory. Um, so that is uh, the way I see it. Um, and, and that, I think, is a very serious matter. And I'm, as I said, I'm happy that even members of, of this audience are able to see that this is a serious matter. Well, children have been abducted in their early age and they, they grow up in the army. They, they become child soldiers. It is not. And, and you see somebody misusing the Bible uh, and, and the fact uh, Ten Commandments. Um, I don't know what, what, what country, what world uh, such a one lives in. Uh, on the matter of Pontland and Somaliland, Yes, um, I know that uh, northern Somalia has a relative peace and they've been campaigning heavily for recognition by the international community. But from the point of view of African Union, um, that matter is very clear that Africa recognizes only one Somalia. Um, 
and I know there's British Somaliland and 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 Spanish and, and Italian Somaliland and and the people out there uh, are saying and 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 Puntland that if you get your act together, we'll be willing to discuss. But it's so vital that uh, uh, the TFG gets its act together and then engages uh, in a constructive sense uh, northern Somalia. But I also know that um, uh, President Abdullahi and the team have been aware that a lot needs to be done to bring fully on board uh, northern Somalia. That is an unresolved issue, but I think the beginning position would be, first of all, to stabilize Mogadishu and, and if you like, southern Somalia, and, and then bring on board uh, northern Somalia. Did you want to comment on the EGAD process? Uh, yeah, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, our friend uh, from the university, in thinking that uh, the infrastructure within EGAD is not quite right, um, and that um, had it been right, then Dafu perhaps may not have happened. Yes, indeed, as we're celebrating, uh, what happened in Nairobi and during the signing of a comprehensive peace agreement, um, then Darfur happened. But I believe for myself that it could even have been worse with the uh, outbreak of hostilities on the eastern border as well. And now that the world is dealing with Darfur, in fact what should have happened was a strengthening of the IGAD initiative. Um, I would have liked myself to see a greater involvement of General Lazarus Mbewo even uh, within the framework of uh, the Abuja negotiations, because then that would have meant continuity. Uh, he would have been there with Osman Taha, even when they would be discussing um, power sharing arrangements and, and, and wealth sharing, because the, the most difficult protocol we all felt in, in, in Naivasha was the wealth sharing protocol, and, and it took us quite a bit, quite a bit of time. Uh, and when you're talking wealth sharing, and, and you have uh, in the north, not as many oil wells and is in the south, um, and, and one little region uh, sitting on, on, heavy, on heavy resources, then you can begin to understand that everybody would like to be very, very difficult when it comes to power sharing or wealth sharing arrangements. Uh, but I think IGAD was not wrong, and IGAD needs to be strengthened. What uh, IGA has demonstrated is African countries can take the destiny of their own regions um, uh, at heart and be able to deal with them and face the challenges of whatever nature, even before involving international community or working in partnership with the international community. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you. You've been, uh, you've been uh, tremendous in terms of giving us insights into the processes and covering so much. And I just want to, and I know I speak for all of us, to commend all you have done in your career on behalf of peace and now on behalf of Kenya. And uh, we want to thank you very much for your presentation, your candor, and your uh, 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 enlightenment to us today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. You oh, took some tough questions. Thank you. <laughs> tough ones. Wish you well in the rest of your visit. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, I hope and to see you soon. Uh, see you again soon. Yes, thank you. 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 Thank you.